University School of Public Policy, Dean Pete Peterson. Hello, CPAC, and welcome to Malibu, California. I'm Pete Peterson, Dean here of the School of Public Policy, and it is a great honor to welcome you from around the world and back in DC, right here to Southern California, to America's most beautiful college campus. Before we get started with our amazing panel, I just wanted to say in reference to one of the elements of the president's speech, and I hope Hayden Williams is listening and there in the auditorium in Washington, DC. I've watched the video of what happened to you many, many times over this last week. And I think what you need are two years here in Malibu, California <laughs> to recover. And so if you're listening, as the dean, I can do this. I want to offer you a scholarship to enroll here at the Graduate School of Public Policy. Wow. <laughs> we have a terrific panel here. I know for many of you on the live stream, you may wonder if there are any conservatives here in California, but this is still Reagan country. To my left, I'm honored to be joined by Congressman Tom McClintock, a real constitutional conservative who represents California's 4th District. To his left, Dr. Lonnie Chen, the Steffi Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution, one of America's great conservative think tanks. Also, he was the policy advisor recently to the National Republican Senatorial Committee. And to his left, the great John Wood Jr., Director of Media Development for Better Angels, and also a uh, supporter uh, and ran against Maxine Waters in the 2014 election, a supporter of the Republican Party here in L.A. County. I want to begin with you, Congressman. Uh, a lot of people wonder, hey, this used to be Reagan country. We, we had just right over the hill here, can't be more than 15 miles away, the great Reagan Library. Uh, and, and really, for many years, Republicans were, were in power here in California. That has all changed over the last 10 or 15 years. And I just wanted to get your sense of someone who not only serves in Congress, but before that served in the state legislature. Why do you think there's been this change? And what lessons can Republicans and conservatives around the country take? Well, not to put too fine a point on it, but um, we started down the road of socialism, and now we're finding out that it doesn't work any better in California than everywhere else in the world has been tried. Uh, you know, my folks came here uh, 50 years ago now, more than 50 years ago. Uh, th this was truly a land of opportunity. It was moving to California. We had low taxes. Uh, our freeways were the envy of the world. We had the finest public school system in the country, one of the finest university systems in the world. We were producing water and power so cheaply that many communities didn't bother to measure the stuff. Um, and over the years, the left took control of our policy. Uh, and now we bear all of the hallmarks of leftist government. Uh, businesses fleeing the state, uh, right. uh, skyrocketing energy prices, uh, imminent water rationing in one of the most water-rich regions of the country. Um, uh, you can go through the, the failing schools, uh, uh, and now the highest effective poverty rate in the country. We, we can't make fun of Mississippi anymore. They're making fun of us. <laughs> and and, and, the, and the, what strikes me the most is, these are the hallmarks of and the results of any jurisdiction where the left has seized control for more than 10 or 15 years. You see all of the same things. So that ought to be a lesson to the rest of the country. Dr. Chen, I want to look back at uh, really a tough time for uh, the GOP and for conservatives more broadly, the 2018 elections. We lost a lot of congressional seats, even Orange County, always known as the Orange Curtain, uh, a place both there and even in the Central Valley, where there were great pockets of uh, conservative support and congressional leaders. Uh, we lost many of those seats in the 2018 election. Your thoughts, again, on what happened just a few months ago, and again, lessons for the rest of the country to consider. Well, I think the biggest thing is we allowed, as conservatives, we allowed Democrats and progressives to frame the discussion in far too many places. If you think about the argument that Democrats wanted to have with a lot of Republicans, 
it was over accusations that Republicans wanted to strip them of protections on pre-existing conditions in health care. You saw this fight over and over and over again across the country. Uh, and Orange County was no exception. California was no exception that you had uh, progressive candidates making the false argument that because conservatives wanted to replace Obamacare with something uh, that would be more free market, that would lower costs, that would be better, that because of that, somehow they wanted to take away people's pre-existing conditions and uh, protections. And I think that ended up being very, uh, a lot of people bought that argument, right. quite frankly. A and I think when you put uh, conservatives on the defensive in that way, it becomes very, very difficult to do well in places like Orange County, which, let's be honest, are very politically divided. They're, the Orange County of today is not the same Orange County that existed 20 or 30 years ago. It's a, it's a different place. It is politically much less homogenous. And so it was a combination of Democrats putting Republicans on the defensive, in part with a false narrative. Right. Uh, the demographics changing. And then the last thing I would say is that I, I do think in California there are some practices that have to be examined in terms of how uh, how we vote to ensure the security of the vote here. I have great concerns about a, a concept known as ballot harvesting, right. which I think in some districts did, did create some challenges because you had votes being counted well after the election was over. A and it was a systematic practice, by the way, that progressives knew they could take advantage of the law in this way. I think we need to examine that carefully. Isn't it somewhat well. ironic that in North Carolina right now, there are people being prosecuted for ballot harvesting yet it is completely legal here in California. Well, you know, when, when, when a single party controls Sacramento and they're able to write all the rules, they're going to produce rules that favor uh, their candidates and their causes. John, I want to bring you in here as well. You've done some incredible work in uh, supporting uh, dialogues across the left and right. Um, you had a, a terrific piece in the Quillette blog recently. Um, responding to Ben Shapiro in a point that he was making that can, as long as conservatives have the facts on their side, that's really going to win the day. And I think he made a very compelling point that it's not just about the head, it's about the heart of the voters that we're going after. And certainly when you hear the president as we've just did, he's a very passionate person for the things that he believes in and how he understands uh, America's role in the world. And so even that, you know, he's not, He's not really, he's not just coming from the head with facts, he's also thinking about connecting to the heart. And I wonder if you could speak to that and, and really uh, connect that kind of conversation to how co conservatives should be communicating. Yeah, thank you very much, Pete. Thank you for the question. Uh, thank you to uh, the Pepperdine School of Public Policy, to CPAC, uh, and to President Trump for warming up the audience uh, <laughs> for the main event here at Pepperdine. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I appreciate you referencing, uh, referencing that piece. What that article was basically about was the fact that we tend to look at politics as a polemical sort of exercise, as a debate sort of exercise. And we would like to think that the person who has the most facts and who has the strongest sort of debate position is going to be able to sort of win the political battle at the end of the day. But that kind of fundamentally misassumes, in a certain sense, just the way people operate, just the way we sort of communicate with each other, and what it is that actually moves people uh, in terms of their political points of view. And by, by the way, Ben Shapiro responded to this piece, and he, he understands the nuances right. of the point that I was making. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that, that, that people get. But we don't focus on it enough, and I think that's relevant in part to what has happened to the Republican Party in the state of California. Now, I, you know, I, I live in South Los Angeles, or while South Central Los Angeles, right? And it's, it's an interesting thing, because when we look at the media, we see these big narratives about you know, left versus right. We look at all the ways in which we have to disagree, all the ways in which we have to oppose each other on all of these vital points. But when you get to the community level, you see stories being told that go beyond you know, the sorts of high-level partisan differences that we have and show us that there is an opportunity for us to rebuild civil society around shared values and around shared interests. And so what do I mean by that? Uh, social psych uh, psychologist Jonathan Haidt says that the human mind is not a logic processor, it's a story processor. I right. can tell you stories about conservatives in South Los Angeles, in Watts, 
uh, in inner city LA who are running schools, after school programs, who are working with law enforcement, building relationships with the community. Uh, black conservatives, white conservatives, people from the inner city, people from out of the community who are working with folks on the other side of the aisle to reforge the bonds of civic partnership and community progress. And I can tell you about liberals who work with social justice organizations who, politically speaking, they lean left in all the ways you might expect them to lean left, and yet they can talk to us about attempts they've made to build community gardens in their district, to do things that are tangibly beneficial on the ground, only to find themselves blocked by the very same municipal and state bureaucracies mm -hmm. that conservatives find ourselves complaining about when we talk about wanting to revitalize and resuscitate community. When we get these sorts of people in rooms together, they may disagree in terms of who they're going to vote for, but they've got a common interest in rebuilding the social fabric and making things better for real people on the ground, mm -hmm. and it is relationships like that that produced the opportunity for President Trump to sign real criminal justice reform on the national level. So God bless him and God bless Van Jones for coming to CPAC and being honest about the fact that, the fact that people who are really concerned with making a difference in America can see past their ideological disagreements to do the things that need to be done in people's real lives. That's the sort of conservatism that I believe in and that's the sort of conservatism that will bring things back in California. Congressman. I, I want to bring you in just on that point because I, I think, especially with the way uh, the president concluded his remarks, this really is about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We make things very complex, but when you get down to really the, the core principles that conservatives support, that Americans more broadly support, mm -hmm. it comes down to these principles and they're practiced most often not at the big national or federal level, they need to be practiced at the local level. And as someone who can quote Tocqueville uh, <laughs> verbatim, mm -hmm. uh, we teach Tocqueville here uh, at the Graduate Policy School, that really is what, a, what makes America great, is it not? Well, the, the American founders didn't call themselves evident truths for nothing. Uh, yeah. It helps to point them out to people, but the fact is that the principles of conservatism are the principles of the American founding, and we don't hold them for blindly ideological reasons. We hold them because over centuries of experimentation, uh, our civilization has discovered that they are the most effective at producing a ha happy, prosperous, uh, and free society. Mm. Uh, that's why we practice them. I do have to push back on one thing you said, that this is that California is still Reagan country. Well, it was Reagan country when we were practicing, practicing Reagan's principles of limited government, of uh, low taxes, low regulations. People were flocking to our state. Uh, it's no longer Reagan country. Uh, quite the contrary, uh, uh, we now have among the heaviest tax burdens in the country, heaviest regulatory burdens in the country, and we're watching a massive outmigration. We're losing a, about 100,000 more people are moving out of California every year now than moving in. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the good news is California Republicans are still winning the vote. The problem is people are now voting with their feet and leaving. And Lonnie, I want to bring you in on this. Uh, Victor Davis Hanson had a terrific piece in the Daily Wire just uh, a couple days ago, he titled it California on the Cusp of Catastrophe. Uh, these issues that the congressman raises, you know, they're talking about the new Green Deal in D.C. Well, we've had the old Green Deal in California for a number of years, and whether it's the, high, the so-called high-speed rail or a number of other uh, environmental policies, we're seeing the real deleterious effect on our own economy here, and not for the 1% at the top. It's not, you know, the folks in uh, the Bay Area are doing fine, the folks down here in Hollywood and Southern California are doing fine, but across great wide swaths of California, the middle class and lower middle class, uh, where, whether we're looking at energy prices or job killing regulations are being driven out of the state. And I wonder if you could speak to a little bit of the, the regulatory environment here and, and how sustainable it is. Well, they, they ought to call it the great red deal here in California because of all the, all the debt that it's caused in, in our state and all the ways in which uh, it's precipitated really a, uh, a unmanageable set of policies. So if you think about, you mentioned the regulatory element of it, uh, everyone already knows that California's got the highest tax burden in the country, one of the highest tax burdens in the country. We have a regulatory system that's driving business away. If you want to look at the result of years and years of bad regulatory policy, you look at the city of San Francisco as a great example of what happens when you see a place where 
there's so much concern about satisfying all of these different constituencies, all of these different interests, and creating a regulatory structure where you don't have affordable housing. You've got people living on the streets. You've got a, a, a public safety system, by the way, that is, not, that is not equipped to handle all of the challenges that are posed by, uh, by these situations. So the, the economics of California, in my mind, are, are a cautionary tale for the rest of the country. And if the rest of the country decides to go the way that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and these people who advocate for the Green New Deal, if, if it goes in that direction, California is example number one of what the challenge will be. And, and I would just say, take slight issue with the notion that we're on the cusp of catastrophe. I think we're already there. Mm -hmm. When you think about the way that the legislature and the governor think about what they need to do in this state, their answer is not free markets and free enterprise and free people. Their answer is more regulation, more taxes, and more government control. Uh, and, and I just think we are well past the tipping point already. Well, and the other piece, just to, I think, uh, put this into the mix of, of uh, policy issues are taxes. Uh, I wrote a piece for Real Clear Policy about a year ago uh, discussing the concept of Bernie-nomics and how that's practiced here, and the fact that we are taxing the 1% higher than any other state in, America, uh, in the United States. And with that, we've been recently evaluated by uh, Moody's, the, the fiscal evaluation firm, that we are the state least capable of withstanding the next recession mm -hmm. because we become so top heavy and so dependent on the 1% that if the market shifts just a little bit, if the economy just shifts a little bit, we are going to be the ones that feel it worse than anyone else. Um, so on that, just on the subject of taxes as well, uh, Congressman, I wonder if you could speak to how that has changed over the well, years as well. As Art Laffer has often pointed out, there's nothing more portable in the world than money and rich people. And, <laughs> and that is a threat given the extremely disproportionate tax system we have in California. But the folks who are really getting squeezed out right now are not the very rich or the very poor. It's the yep. middle class that's leaving, yep. uh, and they're leaving in droves. I've got a fellow who used to work for me many years ago. He now makes a very good living advising um, uh, out of st or, uh, California companies on relocating out of state. Mm. And his, uh, his rule of thumb is if you make over uh, $500,000 a year, hey, you, you can afford the nice weather. Right. Uh, if you're making under $50,000 a year, well, your taxes are relatively low and you've got uh, lots of services. Right. Um, uh, if you make between 50 and 500, get out while the getting's good. And that's what we're seeing in the demographic data. And the, the thing that really gets me is, when you look at the census data, a lot of folks are leaving California. I mean, this beautiful state, we've got the most equitable climate in the entire Western Hemisphere. Right. Uh, we're blessed with the most bountiful resources anywhere in the continental United States. We're on the Pacific Rim in a position to dominate world trade, and yet where are people moving? They're leaving this beautiful garden of a state for places like the Nevada and Arizona deserts. Now, I cannot conceive of a single act of God that, that, that could turn our beautiful state into a less desirable place to live than the middle of the Nevada nuclear test range. But, but and what we're learning is acts of government can do that, and right. look to California and other states so governed like Illinois and New York, you're seeing the same thing. People are leaving in droves. You know, the Legislative Analyst Office here in California earlier uh, in 2018 released a study looking at who was leaving the state. And I thought one of the data points that was really so concerning is that when they broke it apart by age demographic, the largest age cohort leaving the state of California are 18 and under. And it's not as if they're running away. These are the kids in families that are now being taken out of the state. So it's really families, middle class families, large families that can no longer afford to live here. And I want to get to you, John, because I think this point that the congressman raises around who is really being impacted by this so-called Green New Deal economy, this Bernie-nomics economy, are not the rich and the poor. They're the lower middle class and the middle class. And they are not just uh, Caucasian and white, they are across the ethnic spectrum. And I wonder if you could speak to the possibility or the prospect for creating a movement here in California that actually had those groups of people coming together. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of irony in the way that state of California is set up structurally, because 
and you know, it gets to sensitivities about the issue of immigration because we tend to import competition on both ends of the economic sort of ladder. On the upper end, you know, I think about 33 percent of uh, I think about 33 percent of the job uh, job seekers in the state of California have bachelor's degrees. About 17 percent of jobs ha uh, require bachelor's degrees, which means that left over 16 percent is bumped down to compete with people with associate's degrees, who then compete with people with high school diplomas, and then of course on the working class end, uh, immigration. Uh, Obviously, as Trump mentioned this, and I think conservatives, certainly myself, we agree, immigration, legal immigration, can plug holes in an economy and add cultural vitality uh, to places like Los Angeles, which has benefited from it in a, middle, uh, in a million ways. But you can't ignore the fact that it also introduces working class competition for people who are seeking social mobility and are provided precious few avenues for that sort of opportunity mm -hmm. in places like inner city Los Angeles. So on the basis of issues, yeah, there's absolutely a common interest at play that can serve as the, I think, as, as the catapult uh, for a cross for a cross cultural coalition, a coalition that goes beyond the, the typical party divide. But for that to happen, mm. uh, conservatives in the state of California, and I do believe this largely applies nationwide too, have to be in the community so as to preserve the sort of mediating institutions that lie in the, uh, that lie between the state. Where, the, where liberals tend to be concerned and with the individual, where conservatives and libertarians usually tend to be concerned, to be able to sort of redevelop the bonds where people actually meet each other. Churches, families, nonprofit organizations. I work with a lot of nonprofit organizations. We give about $400 billion as a country to nonprofits every year. And one thing I note is that even though conservatives talk about defending uh, individual rights so government doesn't crowd people out of the private sector and so forth, I meet far more liberals in in the nonprofit and social impact sector who are at work on the ground in communities, but then tying those activities to political issues, then I find conservatives who wed those two things. Usually you have conservative activists over here, and I'm generalizing, but then you'll have Republicans who are working in the community, working in education, working mm -hmm. in nonprofits over there, and yet never the two shall meet. Yeah. And that's a problem because if we do not find a way to bridge the gap between our political positions on the one hand, but our actual tangible connections to the community on mm. the other, we'll never find the opportunity to meet people where they actually are so as to forge the coalitions that can actually reshape the face, not just of the state of California, but of this country over the long run. And that is something that the conservative movement ought to stand for. Lonnie, I want to bring you in here as well to talk about that framing issue. You mentioned it before as it related to other elements of the economy, but the putting of Republicans kind of on their back foot, especially here in California, uh, on issues like immigration. You heard the president right there actually make a very passionate case uh, in support of legal immigration. It's something that's a, certainly a part of our national tradition, but also from an economic perspective, when you're down to 3.7% unemployment, we need people working in a whole variety of industries. Here, here. And I wonder if you could speak to some of the, the framing issues that Republicans can take on that, that really can put us back on our front foot, whether it's uh, our concern for the environment, but that's been stretched obviously too far by the progressives, immigration, and, and really for the poor and middle class. You know, one of the challenges I think that, that the conservative movement in general has right now, certainly in California, is that we, we're we too focused on oppositional issues. We're not focused on saying, what is it that we're actually for? Let's right. present an agenda that is attractive to people and that people want to be a part of. So the, the, the Republican Party and conserve, you think about conservative policy principles, those are the principles that underlie a truly mobile society where people can say that they're going to build a better life for the next generation, for their kids and grandkids, and they had themselves. Those are the kinds of policies that we need to be focused on, on enhancing education. Think about all of the entrenched interests in education mm -hmm. and how they oppose things like charter schools and school mm -hmm. choice. Uh, Conservatives need to be for those things. They need to be out there articulating the value of education, for example, and increasing mobility. Uh, we talk about housing, the housing crisis. The conservative solution is to create a vibrant marketplace where we have a lot of housing that people can afford and they can enjoy, and yes, even in home ownership at some point. And those are conservative ideas. Healthcare, Republicans are the ones that want to 
open up marketplaces to lower costs and make health care more affordable for more Americans and more Californians. But too often, I think we as conservatives get stuck talking about what we're against. Let's talk about what we're for. Let's talk right. about why we're for these things. And to your point about the middle class, it is sad because it's the middle class that's left California. Hmm. It's the middle class, indeed, that suffered the most under the policies of the left. And if you think about the ways that we can articulate and be in favor of policies that speak directly to the middle class, maybe we can turn this thing in California around and keep people in this state by showing them there is a way forward that's not just the answer that the progressives and the people on the left have that's driving people out and driving our economy into the tank. Congressman, I want to bring you in on that and also just to speak about your experience now moving from uh, a position in Congress when you were in the majority and obviously things have changed in large part because of California. And I, I guess that's something I, one of the points I want to make from this panel as we speak out to CPAC uh, back in DC and also uh, nationally and internationally that it is, it is in the American best interest, in conservatives best interest that there is a vibrant and growing conservative movement here in California, but I would like you to speak to your experiences in this switchover and what that might portend for the future. Well, I mean, obviously we're watching the American left completely unbridled now, and I think people are getting a firsthand and frightening look at what they actually stand for. That's the good news. Uh, uh, functionally, um, the, the reason that the Republican majority uh, failed uh, in, uh, in, in the last session when, when the American people gave us the majority of the House, the Senate, and the presidency, the House fulfilled all of its promises. We sent over 1,300 bills over to the Senate. The Senate acted on fewer than 300. Mm. Of, of, of why? Because, and I don't, uh, I don't blame Mitch McConnell and the, uh, I don't blame uh, Chuck Schumer and the Democrats for abusing it. I blame Mitch McConnell and the Republicans for not reforming the one thing that blocked virtually everything that we tried to do to fulfill our promises, the Senate's closure rule. Uh, that gives the, uh, the Democrats a filibuster veto over every policy that they don't like. Mm. Uh, that completely destroyed the Republican majority. Uh, we used to send very good legislation over there to watch it die. Now we're going to send very bad legislation mm. over there and watch it die. Uh, but the good news is I think the American people are getting a firsthand, up close and personal look at the American left. And they're realizing that it is a threat to everything that they hold dear as Americans, everything that they hold dear as as free men and women in a free society. You know, I hate to belabor the great, uh, yes, yes. I hate to belabor the great uh, Victor Davis Hanson, but he had another terrific piece on his fear that the, this unbridled progressivism that we're beginning to see really began on America's college campuses. Mm -hmm. And that this, uh, this squelching of free speech, we saw the uh, discussion with Hayden Williams and what he's gone through. I speak on college campuses all the time. We here at the School of Public Policy are an institution that defends viewpoint diversity and free speech on campuses. And I want to come to you, Lonnie, because I really do think, uh, especially very interesting to hear the president announce that this is going to be a, a, a presidential uh, memorandum. Uh, in support of free speech on college campuses as someone who teaches at Stanford um, and has taught here at the Graduate Policy School. I want you to talk about a little bit about the importance of supporting conservative voices in higher education. It's an institution that conservatives need to really assert themselves. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's really become a crisis, I think, and I'm glad to see that the president was, was willing to commit the power of the presidency to talk about this issue. It's a very important issue. Too often on college campuses, viewpoint diversity means uh, a diversity of all views except ones which respect the Constitution or for free <laughs> markets and for conservatism. And that's, that's unfortunate because a, a healthy dialogue, I think, is one of the things that our colleges and universities can be very good at. And certainly, uh, this school is very good at promoting a variety of viewpoints, but too many schools aren't. Mm -hmm. and, and it affects, you know, you, you think it's sort of a small problem, but it's not, because think about all the people it's affecting. Think about all the young people who go through colleges and universities now. Think about those of you who, who have to pay tuition. When I think about the tuition, I'm gonna have to pay for my kids when they go to college. I, I don't want to them, I don't want to be paying for tuition at a place where they're not going to get exposure to the whole set of ideas. I don't mind uh, students getting access to ideas, of course, which are progressive. I just like them to get access to ideas uh, that present the other side. And mm. so we need to be doing more uh, to continue to speak out and identify situations where 
Uh, the left, the academic left, suppresses the ability of people to express a, a different opinion. And, and that, that element of viewpoint diversity, I think, is going to be critical to the success of the American educational institution in the future, because we aren't going to be able to produce uh, women and men who can come out of colleges and universities and understand that there's all these different issues and that they can talk about them not just in the way the progressive left wants to talk about them, but with a true understanding and exposure to all ideas, including ones that support freedom and free markets. You know, when I speak on college campuses, I often quote from a student who graduated from Smith College uh, in the spring of 2018. She wrote a piece for her campus newspaper. Her name is Kim Barrett. And one of the things that she talks about as a conservative who's now just finished four years of her uh, undergraduate indica uh, education at Smith was that she called, called her environment an eggshell culture. Mm -hmm. That as a conservative, very soon on, even within weeks of starting in her freshman year, she felt she had to squelch the things, uh, opinions that she held dear. And I'm, I'm really uh, concerned that that eggshell culture is now beginning to spread to this broader campus environment and that we're not able to talk with one another, not only about political issues, whether they're conservative or progressive, but even important things like around faith. It was great to hear the president again talk about the importance of religious liberty, which is such an undergirding issue. We just had another story up at Cal where a Christian student in this in the uh, collegiate senate there was really shouted down for taking a Christian uh, position defending her faith on that uh, college senate. And so that's another part of this conversation as well. And John, I want to bring you back in here again as someone who's facilitated these kinds of conversations between people who maybe initially might have actual hatred for one another. How can we get through this to be able to allow more conservative views to be expressed on college campuses and, and views of faith. And it's not just Christians, it's Jews and others who are really feeling that they're walking on eggshells when they step onto most college campuses. And again, I would say that is not the case here at Pepperdine School of Public Policy. But John. Yeah, no, certainly not. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it is, it, it's every bit as serious an issue, I think, as, as you mentioned. And I think that the thing that makes it so intractably difficult is the fact that on a certain segment of, of the left, certainly in the social, sort of social justice culture of the left, uh, there's, there's come around to be this point of view that seems to suggest that there's a degree to which uh, free speech and a degree to which intellectual exchange are not... Are, are not merely just sort of the basic ingredients of a functioning civil society, but to a certain degree are actually elements of oppression in and of themselves because they allow for power to be exerted in a certain institutional context in a certain way that might push out the voices of marginalized people. Now, that is, that, that, why people think that way, there's a whole history to it. And I don't want to make light of people's feelings around this issue because the thing that folks need to hear and need to understand across the political spectrum is that if you believe in something firmly, if you believe in something to your core, you need to test your beliefs against the metal and the merits of people who have a different point of view. Mm -hmm. I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, I have a much deeper and stronger understanding of my sense as a conservative and of my conservative a uh, philosophical point of view because of the many conversations I've had with my progressive liberal aunt uh, who voted, for, who voted for, for, for Hillary Clinton and would likely vote for Kamala Harris or someone like that. She has made me a better conservative. Mm. I am a better Christian because of my atheist friends, because they have been willing to go deep into the sorts of conversations that allow us to understand who it is we really are and what it is we really believe. So again, I say to people on the right and the left, do not retreat from the difficult conversations. Accept the fact that you might get your feelings hurt now and again, but willing, be willing in a spirit of love and compassion and Christian understanding if you're a Christian or just a sense that, that we can transcend through patriotic empathy uh, the limitations of our disagreements to find things that may bind us together more fundamentally, go wholeheartedly into these conversations. And that's part of what we're working on at Better Angels is reintroducing that culture uh, to college campuses. And there's a whole lot of good work coming from both sides of the philosophical divide on that issue as well. And all of that gives me hope. And Congressman, isn't that really the challenge, right? That our college campuses, which have always been from our founding, and even before our founding, institutions 
that were seen first as those that were preparing citizens for a, uh, a life of liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. But in, in so many places, they've become these echo chambers that not only are saying the same thing to one another, but they're squelching the voices of others. So you're not getting that kind of dynamic that John, I think, rightly appoints. We're not talking about now squelching progressive voices. We don't want that pendulum to swing the other way, but we need that point counterpoint. And really, colleges should be that place that provides those kinds of But But there, there, there's a reason they're doing that. When you see the ferocity with which the authoritarian left is suppressing free speech in not just in, in university campuses now, but in general society. I mean, uh, I've got so many conservative friends who say they won't even get into a discussion anymore because it's just not worth it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We have to recognize this is, again, a hallmark of authoritarian regimes. And you can go back through history. Nothing new about it. Uh, Churchill, speaking of the authoritarian dictators of his times, and reminded they are afraid of words and thoughts. Words spoken at home, thoughts, uh, or th words spoken abroad, thoughts stirring at home, all the more dangerous because forbidden terrify them. A little mouse, a little tiny mouse of thought enters the room and these mighty dictators are thrown into panic. That is the precise description of the authoritarian left down through history and we're seeing a rise now in our country. That's why we've got to be uh, uh, such vigorous defenders of the First Amendment and uh, you know, as, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Wood says, that's why we've got to engage in this discussion in every form that we can find. You know, the debates that go on back in Washington, they're just a reflection of mm -hmm. the real debate that goes on every day among the American people. It's upon the outcome of that debate that the future of our country is decided. And every single one of us as Americans have to participate in that debate because that's the only way we maintain our Constitution. You know, I, I, we're uh, up against our last few minutes here, and I want to end, I, I mean, I think there's been a very positive conversation, uh, but I want to end on a positive note as it relates to California. I would say there's an element of Reagan country in all of us. <laughs> and that element of Reagan country is a positive outlook. He was governor of this state. Yes, it was, you know, 40, 50 years ago, but at the same time, I, I really do sense, certainly in this room, and when you look at back at DC, hello back to DC, I, I see a real positive spirit there. And I think that is something that uh, we have the eggshell culture on one side that's coming out of ma uh, many American college campuses and coming from the left that you should be worried about. Don't say the, right, the, the wrong thing at the wrong time. But there's also a, a very robust, positive uh, perspective that comes from Reagan that we learn mm -hmm. from him. And so, uh, Lonnie, I wanna go to you. What, how can we, uh, continue to promote this positive sense that even up against the odds that we all have to understand, you know, we are, we, we have seen the old Green Deal, as I said before, here in operation for many years, but I do get a sense that there is a growing exhaustion with the way that this single party state has been run and wanted to get your sense as to what you see going forward. We have to be positive and optimistic because the alternative is we simply allow the other side to dominate the debate and to say there's no alternative. We have to be able to present the alternative. We have to be able to show that we as conservatives have ideas that can bring California out of the stupor that it's in. And I think that part of part of this is, I think it, it's difficult to get beat election after election mm -hmm. and to see outcome that's bad and, and, and to see the things that lawmakers in Sacramento are doing. And it's easy to get discouraged, I understand that. But unless we are out there fighting for our ideals and our values and the policies we believe are the right ones to turn the state around, no one else is gonna do it. So right. it's incumbent upon people in this room, upon people who are listening from abroad and, and, and from afar to realize that California can be an engine of conservative innovation again. It can be a place where great ideas start and where they're tested and where they're built. And I agree that the, that the pressure testing is really important. So we can be that place again. If we aren't optimistic about it, then who will be? It has to, it has to start somewhere. John, we got uh, just about a minute to go. Your thoughts on, on, on the importance of maintaining this positive outlook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, at the end of the day, the irony of politics is that we are in this competing with folks on the other side of the aisle, competing with folks from the other party. And you need that competitive friction always because you can't have the stagnation of ideological or political uniformity. That's why the democratic hedge money, hedge money in the state of California is so dangerous. And yet, 
everything that we seek to do as Republicans or as conservatives for the good of this country, we also seek to do for the well-being of our democratic neighbors, right? And that should remind us that what is really needed in, a, in this country right now and from the conservative movement is not just a conservative story of what America is or a progressive story of what this country is, but an American narrative that highlights and that pulls forward those, those, those eternal values that are enshrined in our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence that represents the heritage of all people in this country, black, white, left, right, and, and center, um, and everything else in between. Right. Um, uh, that is the wealth of our current moment, the wealth of our future, if we can just reunite around those things. Congressman, the conservative movement last must few stand minutes, for that. Last, uh, last few seconds. Well, we have to teach these things, particularly to a generation that uh, I'm afraid is, is losing the memory of freedom. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm so often confronted with the question, well, uh, capitalism is so selfish. And my right. response is, what do you mean selfish? It is the most charitable of, of um, uh, uh, institution that we have ever created. There is only one way to succeed in a capitalist society. You have to figure out of uh, the needs of another person and right. fulfill those needs. That is the only way you succeed, is fulfilling the needs of somebody else. Right, and, and you are rewarded in precise proportion to the, uh, the amount that you're that. able to meet. Mm. Right. And what's socialism? It's exactly the opposite. It's taking of, uh, the earnings of someone who has met another's needs uh, and taking them for yourself. That is socialism. And uh, uh, somehow, this generation, a lot of them anyway, seem to have gotten it backwards. Well, we're and we've certainly got to looking, start to, teaching we're certainly looking to take that, uh, engage that generation here at the School of Public Policy of Pepperdine. I want to thank our audience here. I want to turn it back to Washington, D.C., and another great defender of education, Dennis Prager and Prager U. Good afternoon from Malibu, California.